Broadway and Rector Streets in Lower Manhattan. The present church building, an 1846 Gothic Revival masterpiece at the corner of Broadway and 10th, has served as a place of worship and prayer for generations of New Yorkers and visitors alike. Stand for a minute in the archway of the center aisle and take in the accomplishments of its architect, James Renwick, Jr. The brash and confident yet untested Renwick received his commission at a mere 23 years of age and designed what was the first cruciform Gothic structure in New York. Renwick would later go on to distinguish himself by building the Smithsonian Institution Castle, the main building of Vassar College, the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, D.C., and St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. Though the interior of the church has the appearance of stone, it is in actuality mostly plaster on lath construction. Over the years, stone replaced some of the plaster as opportunity and funds afforded. These old memorial stones set into the wall beneath the window came from the old Grace Church at Broadway and Rector Streets and date back to the 1830s. The two others are newer. One commemorates parishioner Edith Corse Evans, who tragically and sacrificially was lost in the sinking of the Titanic. Miss Evans selflessly gave up her seat on a lifeboat so that a woman with children at home could live. The brass plaque to the right commemorates former sexton Isaac Hull Brown, who was famous for directing social behavior both in and out of church. It was said that Knickerbocker Society hostesses wishing to give correct and elegant parties sought his advice on every detail, from the guest list to the menu. Above the memorial tablets, you will find the first of many beautiful stained glass windows that adorn the church. This exceptional window, with its novel use of opalescent glass, depicts Jacob's dream from the book of Genesis. Created by Mary Tillinghast, who later became chief designer and partner to John Lafarge, this was her first window, and it established her reputation, although the church vestry at the time was not enthusiastic about it. Take a look at the two large transept windows. Both windows measure 14 feet by 29 feet and are made of English stained glass. They were created in 1882 by the prolific workshop of Clayton and Bell. The north transept window has an Old Testament subject, the Patriarchs, and the opposite south transept window has a New Testament theme, Witness to the Incarnation. Their treatment corresponds well four large figures in each with a lower tier that illustrates their significance. The patriarchs are, from the left, Noah, holding the model of the ark, Abraham with a sword and scale, Melchizedek, a symbol of the priesthood, holding a chalice in his left hand, while his right hand is raised in blessing, and Jacob with his staff. In the lower tier, on the left, the ark is being built, the center sections are treated as one scene. An angel appears in the burning bush while Moses hides his face. The last scene is Jacob's dream. It is interesting to compare the style of this Jacob's dream with that of Mary Tillinghast. Notice in the tracery in the upper part of the window the half-length figures of Adam and Eve. In the south transept window, the witnesses to the Incarnation are Zacharias, the wife of Elizabeth, Joseph, and John the Baptist. In the lower tier scenes, you find Zacharias kneeling before an angel, Mary and an angel holding a banner. On the right, Elizabeth embraces her cousin Mary. The marble bust on the left is often mistaken for St. Peter. It is, however, of the architect James Renwick, Jr. in his later years. The no-nonsense figure to the right 
is Henry Codman Potter, sixth rector of Grace Church from 1869 to 1883 and later Bishop of New York. As bishop, he began building the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. The baptistry with its carved oak canopy and the mosaic wall and floor was a memorial gift in 1894. The font is octagonal, a shape dating to the 4th century AD, and a visual reminder of Christ's resurrection and the dawning of the eighth day, the renewal of creation through the coming of God's kingdom and the renewal of our lives in the sacrament of baptism. Its eight sides also remind us that eight people survived the biblical flood, Noah, his wife, and their three sons and their wives. The east window over the high altar dominates the chantry. Known as the Te Deum window, it takes its name from the theme of praise to God described in the 4th century canticle Te Deum Laudamus. Designed by Clayton and Bell in 1878, it is the largest window at 16 feet wide and 33 and a half feet high. It is a fine example of their work with glowing colors, precisely drawn figures, and excellent overall composition. This was the first figural stained glass window installed in the church 32 years after its construction. The figures, with their faces raised toward Christ, represent prophets, apostles, martyrs, and all of creation. Each vertical section, or light, illustrates a line from the canticle. In the center light, Christ is seated at the top. All faces turn up to him in praise. Beneath are archangels, and below them, partly obscured by the reredos, are children, the holy innocents, carrying palms of martyrdom. All the figures are specific characters from scripture. Mary Magdalene is in the center of the martyr light, the fourth vertical from the left. She has long yellow hair and holds a box of ointment. Next to her is Bridget with a crozier and a book. On the right is a beehive denoting eloquence, referring to Ambrose of Mion. In the lowest scene of the section, workers hold implements of their craft or labor. The marigold or wheel in the tracery above the vertical lights contains angels circling the Agnus Dei, or Lamb of God, in the center. Two other angels hold banners. Alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet on the left, Omega, the last letter on the right. The altar in Reredos, designed by James Renwick, Jr., is of French and Italian marble with foliation and bas relief of Constone. The mosaic figure in the center is of the risen Christ with his disciples gathered around as depicted in the last verses of the Gospel of Matthew, when he gives his great commission, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. The Latin inscription below is the last line of the Gospel, translated, And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Flanking Jesus are the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The marble cross was made by Tiffany Studios in 1903 and is inlaid with semi-precious stones. To the right and left of the altar, towering over the choir stools, you will notice the cases of the bicentennial organ commissioned by the congregation in 2008 to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the parish. Built by Taylor and Booty, organ builders of Staunton, Virginia, opus number 65, this instrument of four keyboards or manuals has almost 5,000 pipes and a largely mechanical action in the tradition of the great organs of Europe. 
Installation began in the summer of 2012 and was completed in September of 2013. In the West Gallery stand the lowest and largest pipes of the organ. They are the tallest pipes, 32 feet in length, and are all that remain of the old Skinner organ from 1907. More information about the organ and tower bells can be found at music.gracechurchnyc.org. The pulpit originally stood in the chancel where its richly foliated base would have been more apparent. Designed by William Wells Bosworth in 1893, it is hexagonal and bears at each of its six points one of the great preachers of the early church, Stephen, Peter, Paul, John the Baptist, Barnabas, and Apollos. The honor room is so called because around the inner doorway are incised the names of each optimus, head chorister, for each year from 1894 to the present, and each Optima head choir girl since 1994, when the girls' choir was formed. The room is adorned with beautiful windows, all designed by women artists. Each one illustrates one of Jesus' parables, as recorded in Matthew. The room also contains artifacts removed from the former Grace Chapel, which ministered to the east side of Manhattan during the great immigration influx of the latter 19th century. Also found in the east wall of the south transept is one of the four entrances to the Chantry, a chapel built in 1879 for the children's Sunday school. All the window scenes are of children in the Bible. The chantry is unusual in that it has an apse at each end. Please ask an attendant if the chantry is open, or you may view it from the street entrance on Broadway to your left as you exit. As you head back to the narthex, note the rose window above the west gallery. The rose window, so-called because it bears similarity to a multi-petal rose, is by Clayton and Bell from 1881. As you leave the church, look up at the tympanum over the outer doorway, carved by John Evans of Boston in 1891. The scene is from chapter 3 from the Acts of the Apostles. It is of Peter healing the lame man at the beautiful gate of the temple.
worship at Grace Church today, this morning. A happy third Sunday of Easter to all of you. The, the bells in the tower are, are ringing 11 o'clock. I love it when a plan comes perfectly together. Dr. Allen's pre, uh, prelude ended exactly on time, and we're just about ready to go. Uh, welcome especially to you if you're a newcomer, if you're tuning in for the first time today. Very happy that uh, you've joined us and hope that you'll fill out one of the online newcomer forms so that we can include you in uh, future communications. Uh, hopefully you've all found your way to uh, the bulletin, and you can either print that out or call it up on a uh, separate screen. It's helpful to follow along, obviously, for the hymns and the prayers, and, and I trust that you'll manage that. Also, the rubrics in the bulletin to sit and stand and kneel, join in as the Spirit moves you, or lounge on your couch with a cup of coffee and participate that way. Uh, Perhaps that's what Jesus would do if he were watching live stream worship. So uh, join in any way that you can. And also a, a special way to join in is with our latest game, competition, a Grace Church giveaway. People last week said, I like the giveaway. We gave away the, the, uh, the homemade surgical masks to contest winners. And this week we're playing, we're all playing the secret word game. And it's something that we play every week with the choristers. Right before we come out for the processional hymn, they give the preacher a word, and the preacher needs to find a way to work that word into the sermon. And it keeps the choristers listening, and because they know what the word is, and they're listening for it. Now, you don't know what the word is, unless you were at Children's Chapel this morning. The Children's Chapel that met with Julia and Thomas came up with a secret word. They gave it to them. They have just texted it to me. It's going to be a challenge to work it in, but you don't know the word, and you're going to be listening along to the sermon, and I'm going to be blabbing along at great length today, but it's all, it's all good. You're going to love it. And all of a sudden, you're going to notice that one of these words is not like the others, and you'll think to yourself, aha, that's the secret word. Well, the first five persons who email me, and the email address is in the back of your bulletin, the first five persons to email me the correct secret word after the dismissal will be the lucky prize winners. And what you will win is one of these. Now, these are actually posters that are in the poster cases out in front of the church right now. Over the many, many years, photographers have taken postcards of Grace Church, and some years ago, a, this, these posters were made of all the historic postcards of Grace Church. It's a wonderful, attractive poster, and one of these could be yours if you guess correctly the secret word. So I hope you'll listen along, and I hope that you will play the secret word as we are just about to begin. Welcome again.
Alleluia! Christ is risen! The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia! This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Dearly beloved, we've come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at His hands, to set forth His most worthy praise, to hear His holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation, and so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship Him, let us with silence kneel before Him in penitent and obedient hearts, confess our sins, that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things we ought to have done, and we have done those things we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord, and grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please stand. O Lord, open thou our lips. And our mouths shall show forth thy praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Acts of the Apostles. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Therefore let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart 
and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. portion of it appointed for today, responsively by whole verse. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I called upon him. The cords of death entangled me, the grip of the grave took hold of me, I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray you, save my life. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of my salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem, hallelujah. A reading from the first letter of Peter. If you invoke as father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the Gospel according to Luke. Now on that same day, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe that all the prophets had declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening up the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been known, made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of the Lord.
I would speak to you in the name of the true and living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? A long time ago, in a state far, far away, I was a struggling high school student, treading water, not thriving, not failing, but not thriving academically, athletically, and socially. I know, I know, you look at me now in these form-fitting vestments, with my full head of hair, which the camera only makes even thicker, and you think, how could it be? But it's true. My high school career was remarkable only for how invisible I was. For example, every year as Valentine's Day approached, students could buy carnations for their secret sweethearts. Then on Valentine's Day, the carnations would arrive in homeroom, and everyone was supposed to wear the flowers they had received. The popular kids went through the day looking like shrubbery in full bloom. As for me and my ilk, it was just another day of obscurity. One time, however, Lady Fortune plucked me from anonymity and gave me a turn in the sun with the beautiful people. Every year, the student pep squad, or whatever it was called, would sponsor something called Spinster Week. The gist of Spinster Week was archaic by today's standards. What happened was that the fixed rules of engagement would be reversed, and the girls would ask out the boys. Now, by chance, I had a theater class, and in that class was a smoking hot cheerleader. Even better, she and I wound up thrust onto the stage together to do a few improvisational skits. Surprisingly, these went well. So well, in fact, that she asked me to be her spinster week date. Of course, I said yes, all the while trying to maintain my cool as if this sort of thing happened to me every day. But in fact, I was ready to burst with uncontainable joy. Suddenly, everything and everyone looked different. In a flash, my entire outlook on life changed. How could I even begin to share the news with my friends and family? No one would believe me. I could hardly believe it myself. Now, you may be wondering how it all played out when Spinster Week finally arrived. And to that I would say, you will have to stay tuned for the whole sermon if you really want to know. This week, as I read and reread St. Luke's story of the two travelers on the road to Emmaus, I began recalling and even reliving my surprising encounter with joy all those years ago. It was the afternoon of the first Easter day. Luke describes the two travelers as disciples of Jesus. One was named Cleopas, the other is anonymous. Luke doesn't give us any more clues to their identity, but he does imply that they were close to Jesus and the other disciples during the previous week in Jerusalem, as did everyone around Jesus who was interested and even invested in his ministry. They had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. 
They had hoped that he was God's long-promised Messiah, who would not only redeem Israel, but also inaugurate the new creation. The promise was that when the Messiah came, the ways of earth would begin to realign themselves with the ways of heaven. The wolf would dwell with the lamb. The leopard would lie down with the kid and the calf and the lion. A little child would lead them all, and the earth would be full of the knowledge of the Lord. And all of creation would be healed. All of these hopes were riding on Jesus, but now the mood of the two travelers was one of despair. The previous Friday, it had all come to a devastating end when the Romans crucified Jesus as an enemy of the state. But you heard that as the, these two took their dashed hopes along the road, home to Emmaus, back to where they started, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them. Oddly, they didn't recognize him. Jesus. They took him to be another traveler, a stranger, who joined them in their conversation. The stranger seemed to know quite a bit about the prophecies foretelling the Messiah. As Luke describes, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. When at last they reached Emmaus, the two disciples, still not recognizing Jesus, bid him to stay with them. Evening was at hand. It was getting dark and dangerous. Safely inside, at the table together, Jesus broke the bread and passed the cup. And when he did, the two disciples finally recognized him. In that moment, Jesus vanished from their sight. Where did he go? I've never known what to make of it, but he vanished from their sight just as mysteriously as he drew near them on the road. Nevertheless, here is where the experience of an uncontainable joy welled up in them. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? They realized that all the promises of God for them as individuals and for the whole created order were true in Jesus. They arose and ran all the way back to Jerusalem where they found the other disciples and learned that the experience of meeting the risen Jesus wasn't a figment of their imaginations. The Jerusalem disciples were saying, already the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Still today, we speak the Easter greeting, we exchange the Easter greeting with each other. Alleluia, Christ is risen, the Lord is risen indeed. We proclaim in the faith that through Jesus, death is defeated and God is making the whole creation new. No matter how many commentaries you might read on the Gospel of, of Luke, the road to Emmaus is invariably praised as a lovely story, a beautiful story. But is it true? Does beauty necessarily equate with truth? The resurrection of Jesus is something that's supposed to catch up all of creation. But as we look at the world right now, we have to wonder about the contradiction. We need not rehearse the, the details of the devastation the coronavirus is leaving in its wake, but it is incumbent upon us to ask how the reality we perceive, how this peculiar time we are enduring squares with the Easter faith. Where is God? Recently in the New York Times, I read an interesting review of a new book by the astrophysicist David Lindley. 
And the book is entitled, The Dream Universe, How Fundamental Physics Lost Its Way. Mind you now, I have only read the review and not the book itself. Nevertheless, Lindley laments a trend among 20th and 21st century theoretical physicists to choose beauty over truth. It is more important to have beauty in one's equations than to have them fit an experiment, wrote Paul Dirac in 1963. My work always tried to unite the truth with the beautiful, and when I had to choose one or the other, I usually chose the beautiful, wrote another physicist, Hermann Weyl. Thus today, many physicists finding no evidence of God and even the notion of God deeply unattractive propose an alternative theory of the universe that they see as beautiful, even if it fits no experiment. To explain how we can live in a creation without a creator, they have introduced the concept of the multiverse. Ours is just one of an infinite number of universes that eternally and spontaneously spark into existence and then go dark again. I suppose beauty is in the eye of the beholder. To me, the idea of a multiverse is more complicated, not less outlandish than the notion of God, the maker of heaven and earth. It raises more questions than it answers and is untestable. Let's bring it back to earth. What does all this have to do with the little seven-mile stretch of road between Jerusalem and Emmaus? Again, it's a beautiful story, but can it be true that the risen Jesus really and substantially met the two travelers. Some biblical scholars will say that it can't be true in a bodily, physical sense. We all know that such things don't happen. The story is metaphorical. It's meant to illustrate how the Spirit of Jesus always goes with us. It outlines a pattern of Christian practice. Thus, the prolific New Testament professor John Dominic Crossan has written, Emmaus never happened. Emmaus always happens. Wait, what? I think Croissant wants to be provocative and profound, but his voice is like a shrill and unwelcome kazoo in an otherwise beautiful symphony. The simple question that, he ra uh, that, that, that follows what he says is, if Emmaus never happened, how could it ever happen, is what I would want to ask. It seems to me that a clear and remarkable precedent would be necessary to spark any ongoing pattern in the life of the earliest Christians. In this case, it has to be true, or it isn't beautiful. It has to fit the experiment of real life, or it's meaningless, or even dangerous. It would be like saying that back in high school, the cheerleader never did ask me to be her spinster week date. I imagined the whole thing, but I found the notion so attractive that it caused me great joy and I began to act as if it were true. Well, that sort of behavior can get you into a whole lot of trouble. It is to live in the dream universe, not the real world of space and time. So I would amend Croissant's quote to say, Emmaus always happens because it happened. Here we don't have to choose between truth and beauty. They have met together. Jesus really did appear to the two travelers and Simon Peter and Thomas and others 
Only then does the unbridled joy and ongoing practice make any sense. Emmaus happened. Even though the physical appearances of the risen Jesus ceased after 40 days, the disciples discovered that it was still possible to experience his presence. So yes, Emmaus always happens. What is the pattern that led again and again to the opening of their eyes and the sustaining of their joy? Do we dare try the experiment ourselves to see if it fits real life? Allow me to suggest four practices that we see in the reading, and in the interest of time, I can only file them by title. First, two of them were walking and talking together. Jesus makes himself known to us when, with another person, we engage in honest discussion, questioning, exchange of opinion, and sacred wondering about who God is, who we are, and what it all might mean. Second, the two travelers met Jesus because they welcomed the stranger, not only along the road, but at the, uh, but at the end of the road. Stay with us, they said. Third, the two travelers on the road to Emmaus met Jesus because they opened themselves to the scriptures. They studied the Bible. And beginning with Moses and all the pro prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus makes himself known through the scriptures and our study of the Bible. Fourth, and finally, the two travelers opened their eyes to Jesus when he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it. He became known to them in the breaking of the bread. It was the simple action that Jesus commanded his followers to do in remembrance of him. This is my body, this is my blood. Obviously, our communion and fellowship is impaired these days as we shelter in place. But I long for the day when it's safe again to break the bread and pass the cup at this table here in Grace Church with all of you physically present. It will be a day of rejoicing. It will be a foretaste of the joy before the angels of God in heaven. Well then, now that you have hung in till the end of the sermon, and we are just about at the end, it's only fair that I tell you what happened during Spinster Week back in high school. It was a long time ago in a state far, far away, but I can attest that the cheerleader really did ask me to be her date. It was not the figment of my imagination that my envious friends tried to convince me it was. It was to be a week of pre-arranged activities, something every day, culminating in a big dance on Saturday night. As the week went on, it was becoming clear that we were not a match made in heaven. I was probably in over my head with all the beautiful people. Then at the dance on Saturday night, she vanished from my sight for most of the evening. Where did she go? I don't know what to make of it, other than, other than to conclude that the joy had an end, as all earthly joys do. Nevertheless, in retrospect, it was all worth it because the initial experience of joy itself set the precedent and pointed me forward. Such incomplete glimmers of joy on earth foreshadow and press on to their fulfillment in heaven. The experience gave me a foretaste of the spark I would expect to find, what I would need to find in a future relationship. 
It gave me a fleeting glimpse of the deep, sustained, ongoing joy that God promises us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. Emmaus happened. Emmaus always happens. And thus we will sing this morning, for Christ the Lord is risen, our joy that hath no end. Amen. The service continues with the Apostles' Creed found in your bulletin or on page 53 of the Book of Common Prayer. Let us rise as we affirm our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and do thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people joyful. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in thee can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under thy care, and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let thy way be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. O God, whose blessed Son did manifest himself to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open, we pray thee, the eyes of our faith, that we may behold him in all his redeeming work. Through the same thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. O God, who makest us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of thy Son, our Lord, Grant us this day such blessing through our worship of thee, that the days to come may be spent in thy favor, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, we ask your blessing on Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, Presiding Bishop, Andrew, Allen, and Mary, Bishops in New York, and for all bishops and other ministers. We ask your blessing on Donald, our President, Andrew, our Governor, and Bill, our Mayor. We ask your blessing also for those in special need, James T. Murphy, John Berenger, Fred Lapatinsky, Ann Chapman, Jean Robinson, Richard O'Reilly, Remy, Celia Pearson, Ernest Hansen, David Harris, Fred Walcott, Polly Holliday, Minnie Blake, Claudia Paoloni, 
Tom Hall, Josephine Ferriulo, and for all those who suffer due to the coronavirus, for peace and freedom in this and every place, especially in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, and the Holy Land, for the victims of natural disasters around the globe, especially in this time of pandemic, for all the men and women of our armed forces at home and abroad, and for all victims of war, and for any other concerns we name, either silently or aloud. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom, remembering especially Vibert Mackenzie, and any others we name, either silently or aloud. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life, especially the particular blessings that the people of Grace Church have named for the wedding yesterday of Logan Sackon and Matthew Davis, for doctors, nurses, and healthcare professionals, for the Grace Church family, for the love of family and friends, for the technology that allows us to stay connected, and any other blessings we name either silently or aloud. Let us say together the general thanksgiving that you will find in your service bulletins. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all people. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life but above all for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Would you be seated, please? Once again, I want to welcome all of you to Grace Church for our live stream worship on this third Sunday of Easter. So happy that you've, you've tuned in and have joined us. And, and again, if you are a, a newcomer and you're tuning in for the first time, I hope that you'll fill out one of the forms, the online forms that on the, on the website, it says, I'm new here, and you can fill that out and we'll be in touch with you shortly. And we can uh, tell you more about the Grace Church family and hope to help to get you connected and, and involved, especially uh, uh, when uh, that great future day arrives when times return to normal. But we welcome you and, and so glad that you've tuned in today. So um, here today, uh, w welcome today, we, we, we have TV's own Chase Stanford uh, with us here today and Patrick Allen on the organ and once again, Stacy Waring as our lay reader. By the time the pandemic is over, Stacy Waring is going to be known as America's lay reader uh, because who else is going to do it? We can't let anybody else in the building. And of course, we have up in the gallery uh, Luke Waring running the live stream. So thank you, Luke, for, uh, for your good work. There are a number of things, despite the, 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 uh, the, the shelter in place that, we're, that, that are happening, that are getting going, uh, we're no different than many other organizations where everything we're, we're doing, apart from the live stream worship, is happening through Zoom. And, and, uh, and so we have the Sunday Forum that met this morning. We have Children's Chapel that's happening uh, through Zoom. Uh, we have our Wednesday uh, six o'clock service at uh, Wednesday evening, six, six o'clock. Uh, it's evening prayer on Zoom rather than the, uh, Holy Eucharist in the chantry, but you can join in on that and follow along in the directions. And uh, Dr. Allen is also uh, uh, playing some organ meditations and hymn uh, improvisations, and one of those is today, correct, at four o'clock, and it's on Facebook. 
So go to the website, go to the Grace Church Facebook page, and you'll find your way uh, there to enjoy uh, some of uh, Dr. Allen's wonderful artistry on the organ. And, uh, and speaking of Chase, uh, before this time of pandemic hit, we were celebrating and also uh, being sad a little bit that, that we're going to lose Chase to Trinity Church in Asbury Park, New, New Jersey, uh, where he's going to be uh, the priest in charge and soon to be the rector of, uh, of a great historic parish there. And, and we will be in touch with everybody about how we're going to do this because soon, uh, Chase's first Sunday in Asbury Park is uh, supposed to be the first Sunday in June, just a little over a month from now. And um, whether or not we'll be able to gather to have a farewell party, who knows, but we'll have something when the time is right and safe. But, uh, but, but uh, stay tuned for details on all that, and congratulations, Chase, and, and um, the time is, is coming soon, and it's uh, happening under very strange circumstances where you're just going to go from live stream here to live stream there, and, uh, and, and, and that's going to be uh, 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 something. So uh, the secret word, I hope that you've, you've played. Remember, don't email me uh, until the dismissal. I'm going to look at my watch right at the time of the dismissal. And uh, then you can email, and, and, um, and the first five will have a poster in the mail to them uh, early this week. And also, if you are part of Children's Chapel and knew the word beforehand, um, uh, ho ho hold back, and we'll have... Um, something for you, but the, this, this is for the people who did not know the, the word, and I hope it added a little level of, uh, of fun to the, uh, to the experience. The offertory now uh, will happen, and uh, the, the virtual offering plate is uh, right there, should be right there on your screen. Uh, if you minimize uh, your screen to the left or to the right, it should be right there. And you can give any time during the week through the website, but if you use the uh, virtual offering plate uh, today, that, that's our Sunday offering. And the, uh, the plate up on the altar is uh, symbolically uh, holds all of our offerings to, uh, to God. So I encourage you to be as generous as possible uh, with the offering. And uh, we'll stand now and sing hymn number 210. Let us remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive.
Lord Jesus Christ, by your cross and resurrection, you conquered sin, put death to flight, and gave us the hope of everlasting life. Redeem all our days by this victory. Forgive our sins, banish our fears, make us bold to praise you and to do your will, and steal us to wait for the consummation of your kingdom on the last great day. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of God Almighty, the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. <laughs>